Welcome to the teaching ministry of New Victory Church. We hope that you enjoy this message and are blessed by what you hear. And so the true you, uh, the week before, today I want to talk about just who do you think you are? Just who do you think you are? Because, you know, in all of this, again, we're talking about our identity. Identity is so important. Many of you know this passage of Scripture, I'm sure, by heart. Let's bring up that first Scripture there. Above all else, above all else, say that with me, above all else. So would you say what we're about to read is quite important? (laughs) Would you say it's a priority in your life? Or should it be? Yes. Above all else, guard your heart. For everything you do flows from it. You know, I was thinking about this as I was preparing the message, and I thought, you know, many times as humans, we want to blame other people, but the Bible, you know, uh, about things that we've done, but the reality is, is that everything you do flows from your heart, not someone else's. Uh, It's true, isn't it, right? And so that's why we watch our hearts. And so it's very true what people say as well. You are today, right? Uh, you are today what you invested in yesterday, what you thought yesterday, what, you, what you've learned to think about yourself, you are. So above all else, guard your heart. Why is that so important? Because everything you do flows from it. Now, because identity plays such a sizable role in what we're looking at in this series, it's very important to look at the ways that we eventually arrive at who we think we are today. It's so important. I can't talk to you about and share with you about living out of your true identity in Christ if we don't deal with who we think we are today. See, many times we can know the scriptures up and down. I've known Christians quite mature in the word. They know the word and all these scriptures, but then I'll hear them say things about themselves that I'm like, that's not what the Bible says about you. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Maybe we've done that. Heaven forbid, but I'm sure that we've all done that, right? We're like, oh, yeah, and the Bible says this, and when we're in church, we're like, we know all the scriptures, and we know all these things, and then when you're just dealing with, or, you know, hanging out with someone during the week, they're like, yeah, well, I'm this, and I'm not very good at that, and, and I'm, my dad always told me I was useless, and it's, it's, there's kind of like a disconnect there, isn't there? And uh, so that's what we want to, we're going to look at today. How do we get to our identity? Identity is mainly thought to be formed by our life influences such as culture in our home, uh, society, race, religion, physical attributes, occupation, even hobbies and interests. I'm not saying all those are right to form your identity from, but that's what we tend to form our identity from. Yeah, you know, when you say to someone, who are you? They'll say, well, I'm a carpenter. Well, that's not who you are, right? That's what you do. We're not human doings. We're human beings, uh, Jesus didn't say to Peter, what do you say I do? Did you get that? What did Jesus ask Peter? Who do you say I am? But Jesus said, you see me do all the miracles and all these things. He said, you see all the things that I do. But Jesus did what he did out of who he was. And he said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Jesus was secure in his identity in the Father. And we also, likewise, need to be secure in our identity in the Father because of what Jesus has done. Look at this point here, this next slide. The culture in our home, however, is without a doubt the most prevalent out of all the influences in our life. Your upbringing is where the root uh, growth of your identity begins. This is why people who tend to have problems later on in life um, if you've ever worked, um, and Melissa and Dennis, you guys have, if you've ever worked with a, a, at street churches, um, a lot of times the problems that the people have that you're helping were actually rooted in them in their younger years. Many times there's stories of abuse and things like that, and of course people allowed that to shape their identity. I remember one time, um, hopefully this doesn't offend anybody, but I just want to be raw and real about it. I was hanging out with a good friend of mine. We were really good friends, and we were helping his dad. And uh, we were working on something. We were trying to get the cap on his truck. And uh, so he asked his son, I'm not going to use any names. Uh, He asked his son, he said, hey, uh, Joe, go grab me a wrench. So he brought it back, and it was the wrong wrench. And he looked at his son, and he said right in front of me, he said, John, you're about as useless as tits on a bull. Do you know what that spoke into? his identity. It's sad, isn't it? And you know what? Us dads make mistakes, don't we? And my dad said some things to me that really he was upset and I know he didn't really mean. But those kind of things speak into our identity. 
And even to this day, like, uh, I, I don't, he's in the Maritimes, so I don't see him as much. But the, all the times I hung with him after that, he was dealing with feelings of uselessness. Right? So it'll come from authority figures, and especially those in the home. Maybe you didn't have parents. Maybe you grew up with a guardian. Uh, but there's something about children that we are looking to adults, and we are looking to those who are older than us, well, until they hit their teen years. Then they know everything. Uh, but before that, they are literally looking and they're wanting. Do you know that kids actually cry out for boundaries? If you, if you see a kid screaming their head off, completely undisciplined in Walmart, most of the time what would help is if the parents would start setting boundaries and sticking to them because kids are crying out for them. In the same way, kids are crying out for identity. And this is why we need to pray, pray, pray for the youth of this generation if you see some of the garbage that they're being told they could be, and they're not. Are you following me? You understand what I'm saying? They're actually mutilating their bodies over identity. The church needs to stop being quiet on this. But we need to do it because we love people, not because, oh, I don't agree with that. Well, that's fine, but what are you going to do? We need to love people. We need to love people. Identity is so important. It's so powerful. Your identity begins, the root growth of it begins in the home. Think about it. Your parents or your guardian had the first opportunity to speak into your life in your younger and more influential years. As children, we all looked at the world with wonder and full of questions, and we received our first answers to most of those questions in the home. Dad, why is the sun yellow? I don't know, son. Dad, why is that guy's bike blue? I don't know, son. <laughs> of course, now, thank you, Lord Jesus, for Google. I just say to Judah, hey, Google it. <laughs> uh, in, in my dad's generation growing up, he could, growing up, he couldn't do that. And, uh, but we're full of wonder and we have all of these questions. And a lot of those questions are connected to us figuring out who we are. Why do you think the devil is going after a generation right in, the, right in those years that they're trying to figure themselves out? Amen? That's, that's why he's doing that. We don't war against flesh and blood. We need to remember that. We war against people that are being used by the devil. That's what, like a marionette on a string. That's what's going on. We need to love people. Love wins. Arguments don't win. I've lost a lot of arguments, but love wins every time. We need to love people. Jesus loved people, and sinners love Jesus because he loved them. Right? He said, go and sin no more, but he still loved them. Neither do I condemn you. I don't condemn you. But hey, what you're doing is hurting you, and uh, you should stop lest something worse befall you. Isn't that what Jesus said? Right? So I'm, I'm, not, I'm not talking about compromise here. I'm saying that we love people. I think I said this last week or the last week to Shell. Do you really feel love when someone says, I tolerate you? Love goes beyond tolerance. Love goes beyond tolerance. I want, I want to be loved. I don't want to be tolerated. Man, I have such a great church family. By the way, thank you guys all for all the birthday and the anniversary stuff. I'm not even kidding. My phone was dinging all day on my birthday. It was like ding. It was awesome. I mean, I'm, I don't, I'm, I'm not a big birthday guy, but it was so awesome. So thank you so much. And your kind words about our anniversary, thank you. But what I wanted to say was, how do you think I would feel and how would other people feel about our church if I'm like, hey, you know what? We've got a real great church. They gave us this card for our anniversary and they say, hey, Pastor Jason, we just tolerate you and your family. <laughs> right? Like, it, we, oh gosh, that just feels so good. Love goes beyond tolerance. Are you following me? Are you following me here this morning? So we need to go beyond tolerance. And the funny thing that you'll find out in, in, in society is the people that decry tolerance are the worst at showing it. So we need to love people. Love people. If you grew up with a parent, like I was saying, especially as a father who constantly told you that you would never amount to anything in life, and you allowed that to sink into your heart, and you allowed it to dictate a deep part of your identity, then you will continue to live out that identity until you put a stop to it and learn to think differently. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Guard your heart above everything else because everything uh, that you do in life comes from your heart. Our hearts are the roots, or I should say the place of our identity. If you don't refute this deep-seated belief in your life, you will end up living it out because we all live out of who we think we are deep down in the core of our being. We can put on projected images. You guys know what I mean by projected images? Well, I really want 
Uh, I, Dion, hey, good to see you here this morning. I'm going to use it for your example. I really want Dion to like me, and I heard that he likes this kind of music, and he likes this, and he likes this country, and he likes this. So I'm just going to say I like all those things because I want Dion to like me. Are you following me? But, but I, might, I might hate the coffee that, <laughs> that you're right. And I'm just not being me, but I'm not being me because I want you to like me. And the problem is, is you end up liking someone who's not me. Does that make sense? And so we can project identities and we can get real good at doing that. But when you're on your bed at night, just before you fall asleep, you are with who you really think you are. That's why I don't believe, you know, God doesn't believe in atheists. Because on their bed at night, I mean, they're really dealing with thoughts that they would me- probably never share in the public forum because it would discredit their atheism. I've talked to quite a few guys where that was actually the case. And so we live out of our identity. I want to talk to you about a guy named Walter or Nathan. Nobody was really sure. And if you've read my book already, you, you've heard this account. Um, there was a couple that came to our church in Kimberley where we pastored for several years. And uh, when they came in, they introduced themselves as Walter and Martha. And uh, so they come out to the first service. I think somebody from our church invited them, in fact. And uh, so they come out to the first service. And uh, literally in the first service, when I was talking to, to them at the end, you know, hey, thanks for coming, guys. Where are you from? We asked them a few questions. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. And, uh, you know, talking to Walter and Martha. And so then they came out a week after that. So they come out a second week and we're like, as a pastor, you get a little excited about that when you see someone the second week. And I think, hey, maybe these guys will come become a part of our local uh, church family. And we're always excited about that, of course. Um, no pastor doesn't want to see their church grow. Come on. No church doesn't want to see their church grow. And so he come out the second week. And so this time we talked a little bit more after the service at the end. And, um, you know, all of a sudden he went into uh, this story about how Jesus left the 99 to go find the one. And he led, with, he led with that to ask me if I would like to go for lunch or coffee. <laughs> Isn't that kind of odd? It's a little odd. Well, you know how Jesus left the 99 to go find the one? I was wondering if you'd like to get coffee with me or go for lunch. I'm like, that's kind of a really odd opener to ask me that. That's very bizarre. And I want you to have that imprinted as I share the story about Walter or Nathan. And uh, so I I just want to read the account here because I want to get it uh, how I recorded it. So now I had heard that uh, sorry Walter was unemployed. So I said, you know, how about we uh, do lunch this Wednesday? Because he asked to go for a coffee. But I said, let's make it lunch. Let's go for lunch on Wednesday. Looking a little surprised at my immediate willingness to accommodate him, he sheepishly, no pun intended, he left the 90, uh, never mind, okay. He sheepishly answered, sure. After we agreed upon a location, he said in a somewhat we'll see tone, well, I hope to see you there. I retorted with absolute certainty, you will. When Wednesday came, I arrived at the restaurant 15 minutes early to pray concerning our time and to give him absolutely no excuse to question my sincerity. He arrived about five minutes later. After we ordered a lunch and got the small, task, uh, small talk and pleasantries out of the way, I said, well, Walter, tell me about yourself, bro. And he piped up right away, almost offended, and said, actually, it's Nathan. I'm like, what? He's like, my name, it's Nathan. Now, this was a little bizarre because, as I said, his girlfriend referred to him as Walter while they were at church. Already, there was clearly an identity problem. Choosing to let it slide, I responded, sure, okay, well, tell me about yourself, Nathan. For the next 30 minutes, almost without a millisecond pause, Nathan told me his life story. It mostly consisted of everyone who hurt, disappointed, abused, or stole from him. He talked about weird and wacky accidents that happened to him on every job site that he ever worked, along with every employer that allegedly took advantage of him. According to him, his whole life was someone else's fault. Once it finally seemed like he had run out of steam, and it was a while, (laughs) and started eating his food, which had arrived 15 minutes into his rant, I spoke up. I had pretty much finished my meals. I had barely spoken and took this as an opportunity to share how I completely understood what it was like to be hurt, to be abused, and be taken advantage of. I continued to share what I did about it using the counsel that I found in God's word. I told him, even with all that happens to us in this life, only we can decide whether or not we will let it define us. And in order to do that, we have to look back at it and ask ourselves, okay, that was then, but what am I going to do now? The whole time he was looking at me, I could tell he wasn't really listening. You guys know that look when someone's staring straight through you. 
All right? Then I asked him, okay, Nathan, so let me ask you, what do you want to do with your life now? He looked down at his plate, then he looked up at the light above the table and proceeded to tell his whole life of misfortune all over again. As they say, like a broken record. We got together a few more times for coffee and even lunch. I went and helped him boost his car one time. I don't have it in my book, but I remember that. I, was, I just wanted to be there for him, so he had no excuse. I asked the question again and again, but he could never give me an answer. Eventually, he also got offended with me, and I never saw him again. As around and around the mountain, he went. You see, his identity was so deeply rooted in being a victim of his circumstances that he believed that that is who he would ever, always ever be, right? It's so rooted, all these things. It was, I can't, you know, I didn't even put it in my book, but it was his uncle, it was his mom, it was his dad, it was employers. I mean, it was incredible, the list. But he couldn't answer what he wanted to do now because his life, his identity was so rooted in what had happened to him. How many of us have met people like that? Amen? Especially, again, guys involved in street ministry, what do you often hear? You hear the folk story over and over and over again, don't you? And a big part of that is getting them past that, is getting them past that, to see that in Christ that they can have a new identity, that the old can be kicked to the curb so that they can begin in the new. It's all about identity. Nathan's story shows us the power of perceived identity. Now, it shows us the power to a negative side, but can you imagine that uh, can you imagine that if someone can get through to Walter Nathan and help him see his identity in Christ, which, which God willing, I tried so hard with him. I prayed for him. I, I, I even did kind of deliverance with him without him even knowing it because I didn't know how he would receive it. But it wasn't me, but I pray that it would be someone. Can you imagine that if he takes that same oomph, <laughs> right, of his perceived identity and puts it into his identity in Christ? Wow, look out. And I wonder how many of us here, maybe we don't have you know, such a vivid story like Walter Nathan, but what are things in our lives that are holding us back from living out the identity that we actually are in the spirit? Because the old's gone, the new's here, right? The old's gone, the new's here. Paul tells us that very clearly. We're not waiting for the new, right? About pie in the sky when we die. I remember one time I heard a preacher say, how many of you know that God sometimes wants you to have steak on the plate while you wait? It says that he prepares a table for you in the presence of your enemies. Right in the middle of the battle, God sets up a table. You sit down and you're cutting the steak and the devil's like, Ugh! God just does that right here, right now. We're not waiting for that. You see, we're, we are a new creation now. Paul says now we are no longer to view anyone after the flesh. Now, we're not waiting for that. I mean, I can't wait for the new body, but man, I'm going to live out the benefits of the new creation now. Right? But who do you think you are? Who do you think you are? See, the main reason when we started out the series, I talked about how I grew up hearing, well, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. Well, you're just a sinner saved by grace. And the main reason I thought that was because that was what I heard in the church circles that I ran in. I've actually talked to a few people, and they're like, I've never heard that saying before. Oh, really? I said, but have you thought that? Totally. See? So people have thought that, that I'm just a sinner saved by grace. But that's not what the Bible teaches of the new creation. The old is gone. The new has come. But it wasn't until I started getting into the Word, and I began to realize uh, there were a few things that had been said in churches that weren't really the, what the Word of God said. <gasps> How many found that out in life? Sometimes there's things said in church and said by church people that aren't really what the Word of God says. Paul actually tells us to avoid myths and wives' tales. And when we're saying things in the church as though they're the Word of God and we can't find them in the Word of God, that qualifies as a myth and a wives' tale. And how many lives have been ruined over those kind of things, like God puts sickness on you to teach you a lesson? What a pile of garbage that is. Not under a New Testament, he doesn't. I know that happened to Miriam. I understand that. But we're under a new covenant with better promises. Amen? And so, no, God doesn't do that. All, all these things that we say to make ourselves feel better about situations in, life, in our life, but the Bible doesn't say that, and especially about our identities. I was, it was clear that my home and church culture spoke things into my identity. 
Don't get me wrong, most of what I learned from home and church lined up with the word of God and was a blessing, but sometimes we can believe and repeat particular doctrines without really looking into the word for ourselves. It's true, isn't it? I mean, man, there's, we've been having Bible study with, kids every, with our kids every night. It's what we always do, and we pray, and we pray for this church for you guys every night, just so you know that. I want you to know that. I'm not bragging. I want you to know that we care about you. Amen? And uh, there's been times when we've been going through the scripture and Patricia will be like, oh, well, that's, people always say this verse that way, but that's not what it says. We've had times like that, haven't we, right? We're like, it actually, it actually doesn't say it that way, right? Like money is the root of all evil. It, the Bible doesn't say that. You won't find that in the Bible. What do you find? The love of money is the root of all evil. Money is neutral. It can't be good or bad. The morality of the actions that you do with money is determined by the heart of a human being. Okay? And so there's these things. And remember, if we're transformed by the renewing of our mind using the word of God, it's important that we know what the word of God actually says. And especially when it comes to our identity, or I will think that I'm just a sinner saved by grace. The problem with I'm just a sinner is I will just sin. That's the problem with it. And then people use it as an excuse, just like, oh, I'm only human, I'm not perfect. Well, I'm just a sinner. No, you're not. And see, when we live out of our true identity in Christ, uh, that changes. So who do you think you are? I grew up, I've shared this before, I love my dad and my mom, I absolutely love them, and, and they taught me in the word of God, and they took me to good Bible-believing, spirit-filled churches, and I love all that. But I tell you, I got almost zip affirmation from my dad growing up. And I can't even tell you the problems it has caused me, even in ministry, when I've tried to get affirmation in other people. You know how you get affirmation or try to get affirmation in other people? By trying to please people. How many here have found out in life that that's not possible? And so here you are trying to get affirmation by trying to keep everybody happy, and you can't keep everybody happy, so you end up not getting what you were trying to get in the first place. You, you end up no affirmation, and there's people that aren't happy. Right? It's just, and not just ministry, but anything. We can do that in anything. So I was trying to find my affirmation in other things. I was also severely bullied in school. You don't have to put up your hand, but how many of you were bullied in school? And I mean severely where I was punched. I was pushed to the ground and my face pushed in the dirt through elementary until about grade eight junior high school where I stood up for myself. I actually grabbed a guy by the scruff of his coat in the locker room. I picked him up right off of his feet. I slammed him into the locker, and I said, leave me alone. You know what's very interesting, though? The, the Lord revealed to me a few years later that I allowed myself to be de demonically influenced. I should not have been able to lift this guy off his feet and ask God to forgive me. However, they stopped bullying me, too. <laughs> so it's like... I rarely say this, but thanks, devil, <laughs> right? Like, you kind of helped me out there without realizing it. You know what I mean, okay? But I realized I should not have been able to pick that guy up off of his feet. But they never bugged me again. But I still carried that bullying, you know, that, 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 that whole bullying thing. There was a girl in school that I really, really liked. I had a super big crush on her in elementary, but she was a part of the prep crowd. And the prep crowd was the crowd that bullied me because I was a kid from a lower-income family, I didn't have the white sport socks that everybody had. You wouldn't remember this, Dion, because we're about the same age. It was only cool to wear white sport socks. Men, they, they had the sport stripes, like super sport stripes, <laughs> SS. These are SS Camaro socks. Anyways, but uh, yeah, if you had blue or gray socks, they would make fun. Isn't this ridiculous, what I'm saying? I feel ridiculous explaining this to you, and it shows you how ridiculous it is when it comes to peer pressure and speaking into people's identity stupid things. But I told this girl that I liked her. And she actually told me that she liked me too. But when she got around the rest of the prep crowd, it completely changed. And I tell you, that wrecked me when it came to my identity. It actually probably wasn't a bad thing because that's not what I was supposed to be finding my identity in anyways. Amen? And so, you know, we have these experiences. I was trying to please people. Proverbs 29, 12 says... Uh, don't get into the fear of man. It will prove, only prove, to be a snare to your soul. Your mind will and emotions. When you're trying to please people, your mind will and emotions, okay? So when you're trying to please people, you'll, you'll think of ways that you can please people. Your mind will just be overwhelmed. It'll be, it, your time will be spent thinking, how can I please people? Your will, what you do, you'll do things to try to please people. 
And then your emotions. If someone does something in a certain way and you feel a certain way and they're not happy, then you'll do something again. And what happens is you're in a snare. Do you see that? You're caught in a snare because of what people think and because you're trying to gain affirmation from people. So I read a book. I'm just going to share this really quick. It was called The Search for Significance by Robert S. McGee. And I'm sharing that here this morning because if you are relating and your bell is being rung by what I'm sharing about getting affirmation from people, you need to read that book. As a matter of fact, I think it's still a part of our curriculum for Victory Bible College, right? And I read that book and I realized that my significance was found in Christ alone. And his feelings for you will never change. Amen? So the other thing I want to talk about this morning is that experiences do not determine our identity. So I experienced, well, I had lack of experience of affirmation from my dad. And then I experienced severe bullying in school. And then I told you as a young man that I had issues with magazines that young men shouldn't be looking at. I shared that with you that I was 14 years old and first came across those at a, at a friend's house in his dad's gun cabinet. And what happened was um, I began to think that maybe this is who I am because of the feelings that I had. But the reality is, is that experiences do not determine your identity. They're just experiences. That's all they are. Experiences do not determine your identity. The problem with finding or trying to find your identity in experiences, especially when it comes to, the Bible says, avoid sexual immorality because it sins against your own body. The problem with trying to find your identity in those experiences is that those experiences are in the flesh, and we no longer look at any man after the flesh, man as in person, okay? So what happens is we have a society now with all this all kinds of sexual stuff going on and identity and gender and everything, we have people trying to find their identities at a flesh level. And the problem is, is death is in the flesh, and what death is in goes to the grave. So you're trying to find your identity in something that's temporary. Does that make sense? And so I began to realize that, yeah, I was having these feelings and everything, and because they were so crazy real, if you've ever been a teenager here, (laughs) <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. You feel like this must be who I am because it's what I feel. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's so strong. You think it must be what I'm to derive my identity from. Yeah. But it isn't. Of course, you know, the flesh likes to be pleased. And I mean, whose doesn't? I mean, you know, if the wife comes up and she's like, honey, do you mind if I give you a massage? doesn't happen that much. But uh, anyway, <laughs> I'm teasing. Well, maybe I'm not. But anyways, we... <laughs> We always say with every little bit of teasing, there's a little bit of truth. Anyways, and uh, do you think I'm going to be like, nah, are you kidding me? I'm going to jump right on that bandwagon because my flesh likes to be pleased, right? Who doesn't like to eat a big pizza or whatever you like? Your flesh likes to be pleased, right? But when it came to the, as a young man, the sexual things that I was involved with, I found that, yeah, sin is pleasure for a season, but every season ends. Every season ends, right? I thought, man, look at, I started looking at this. And I was like, this, is, this can't be right. Again, one could easily accept a sensual experience as proof of our identity. And many do nowadays. But look at this next point here. We must not ignore the deep conviction that our identity has to be rooted in something far more significant than our fleeting fleshly pleasures. And the thing is, is even though I was dealing with that as a young man, and I thought, maybe this is me, maybe this is me, my born, because I was a Christian, Right? I was a Christian, but I thought I was just a sinner saved by grace, and here I was struggling with sin. And even though I felt like, oh, these things are so strong, this must be who I am because it's so strong, there was something inside going, no! Are you following me? When, when you're born again, your spirit will, will just gnaw on the inside of you. And it'll say, no. It's like deeper. And so here we have young people nowadays and even older folks trying to find their identity at a flesh level. That's not it. In other words, having a sensual uh, experience is not a solid means from which we are to form our identity. It's far too surface level to equate that kind of deep significance and purpose for our life. The true nature of the flesh is that it wants you to get pleasure and satisfaction no matter the cost. That's what the flesh wants. It's the mantra of the world that has been ringing loud and proud, and I think it really gained ground in the 60s sexual revolution, which is if it feels good, then do it. And the problem is, is what is good doesn't always feel good. If you never had any anesthesia in surgery and you actually felt the knife cutting, it wouldn't feel good. 
But thank God for the surgeon doing the surgery that when it heals brings you health. But it doesn't, it doesn't feel good at first. These guys that are all buff and cut. I was watching uh, uh, on Netflix. It's called some, uh, Generation Iron. Anybody ever see those ones? Uh, some of you are like, no. Anyways, those guys gross me out, all the big muscles. I just find it fascinating. But what's, what's, they don't get to where they are by feeling good. <laughs> they don't. It's a lot of pain. Building muscle is ripping muscle first. That's what happens. If you didn't know that, you probably learned that in school. In order to build muscle, you have to rip muscle. So they're ripping muscle to get where they are. As my granddaddy used to say, no good thing ever comes without hard work. And hard work doesn't always feel good. So if it feels good, do it. It just doesn't work. And quite honestly, it's destroying our society. It's the root behind all the junk that is going on right now and all the junk that's being spoken into the identity of our young people. You know, when it comes down to it, we just need to see sin for what it really is. I went to the kids' school. They asked me to come and talk about this, talk, you know, talk to some of the young people there about this. And I said to them, I said, guys, you need to see sin for what it really is. I said, let me give you an example. When my son Judah was a little baby, and they tied off the umbilical cord. Any ladies remember that? When they put the elastic band around the umbilical cord that was still on the baby. And they do that to choke the life out of the flesh that is there. And so that eventually, it sounds gross, but it's true, it rots and falls off. Well, I wasn't told that. <laughs> so here I am. I jumped right in as a dad. And I'm changing, Judah, I'm changing Judah's diaper one day. And uh, I'm like, got it all changed and everything. And I'm like, man, why does he still reek? Like, he, something really smells. So I'm, like, smelling his toes, you know, and I'm, like, smelling up around his head, and I'm smelling his hands, and then I even flip him over and look at his bum to make sure I got everything, and then I flipped him over, and I went to smell the diaper in the front, but what I got a big whiff of was the rotting flesh of the umbilical cord, and I'm not kidding you, it almost knocked me out. It was the smell of rotting flesh. Please, this morning, even if you only get one thing from today, I want you to understand and see sin as that. It's death. <laughs> Usha's got like the funniest look on her face right now. She's like, oh. no, I, you should be disgusted by it. Not by sinners, but by the sin that's in their life that's destroying their life. See? See, when we view sin like that, it makes us want to have nothing to do with it which is what the Bible tells us. Jude says, don't even have anything to do with the clothes stained by the flesh. Have nothing to do with it. And this is the sinless part where we're living out the sinless that we are on the inside. So holiness, yes, folks, is saying no to sin. Titus, Paul says, for grace appeared, right, for this reason, to teach us to say no to ungodliness. Grace didn't come to say you're okay in ungodliness. We affirm you in ungodliness. Grace came to say you don't have to live in it. Amen? That's what grace is for. Grace does not affirm us in sin. It enables us to live outside of it. Again, we don't hate our bodies. They have desires. And we need to keep them in line. And sometimes they're sinful. Being hungry is not sinful. But if you sell your birthright for a bowl of soup, like Esau did, that's sinful. He sold his birthright. That was huge. So we don't hate our bodies. They're the temple of the Holy Spirit. We hate the sin nature that dwells in them. We hate sin itself because it always ends in death. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death, Romans 6.23. Sin never pays, it demands payment. It has caused and is still causing the death of marriages, of families, of businesses, of countries, and even whole nations. Sin eventually kills everything that it touches. And thus Paul says to us in Romans 12.9, to hate what is evil. To hate what is evil. We don't hate people, but I hate what sin is doing in the life of people. I hate it. I want nothing to do with it. And I want to tell them that they can be free from it. You see all this product in the, in the stores, in the meat section, free from? You guys know what I'm talking about, right? That's what we are when you come to know Jesus Christ and your new creation. You are free from sin. 
It's still in your life, but, but in, in your body, but Paul says we're dead to it. Come on, folks. It has no control over you anymore. It no longer masters you. Paul said, I will be mastered by nothing, right? Paul said to the believers in the church, next slide here, guys, to the church in Thessalonians, he said this, for it is God's will that you should be holy. What does he say, you? Oh, let's shout it out. So is he making a suggestion? (laughs) No, okay? He said, you must abstain from sexual immorality. God won't do that for you. I'm saying this because I want to speak into the hyper grace message, which is Jesus has done it all. I don't have to do anything. No, no. The Holy Spirit's not abstaining for you. The Father's not abstaining for you. Jesus is not abstaining for you. You must abstain. But you have the grace of God and the empowerment of the Lord Jesus Christ in your life to abstain. How do you think he abstained? By the power of the Spirit of God in his life because he walked as a man with all of the desires that we have. He was tempted in every way but was without sin, right? So you must abstain from sexual immorality. Each of you must learn. So look, it's learning, right? We're practicing righteousness. This is not a blah, blah, blah. This is a we're learning, we're growing, and thank God for the grace of God that when I do blow it and I confess my sins that God is faithful and just to forgive me from all unrighteousness. That verse was given to us to know that we are free to practice righteousness and to not get condemned for when we do blow it. Amen? So you must, yes, but there's going to be a grace for you to do it. And when you make that decision, the Holy Spirit, the parakletos, the one who comes alongside, will step in and go, awesome, let's do this together. Each of you must learn how to control your own body, the temple, in holiness and honor, not in lustful passions like those who do not know God. And so the Bible is very clear that Jesus hasn't done it all when it comes to us living out the righteousness. We have a part to play in it. Jesus doesn't take us over and do everything for us. We make decisions, and he gives us the grace to carry out those things. As a young man, I began to see that now as a believer, I needed to learn how to control the lusts of my flesh, lest they controlled me. If we are controlled by something, then we are actually mastered by it. And if we're mastered by it, then we're not really free. And God has called us to walk in freedom. Jesus Christ has set us free. Why? To be free. I love how that's the answer. Okay, why did Jesus set us free? Anybody? To be free. Right. He whom the Son set free is what? Oh, free indeed. Look at that, right? And then he says in another passage, or Paul says, he says, therefore, let not yourself be yoked again to a bond of slavery. See, so we can make that decision to be bound in something again, can't we? God doesn't control our wills. You didn't lose them when you got saved. I know there's a teaching out there that says that, and I don't see that in the Bible. You still have a will. We're co-laborers with Christ. Even in your sanctification, you're working with Jesus and the Holy Spirit. And you've got his grace to practice. Amen. I'm thankful for that. Amen. So who, who you think you are really matters, folks. So I want you to ask yourself this morning, and to be honest, here's a few questions. Who do you think you are? Why do you think that's who you are? What past experiences can you see that brought you here? Are they based in the truth of God's word concerning you? If not, are you going to make a decision to stop allowing them to shape your identity any further? Because when you realize that a thought towards yourself does not line up with God's thoughts towards you, your thought needs to stop. You need to kill your idea of who you think you are and believe what, who God thinks you are. Are you following me? This is a part of casting down every thought and every imagination that exalts itself up and says that it's higher than the word of God. And we know that we believe that it's higher than the word of God because we're living it out and not living out the word of God. So what do we do to get that lower and to the obedience of Christ and to, and to exalt the word of God higher in our lives? We start walking it out. Blessed is the woman at whose breast you nursed. And Jesus said, blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and do it. Right? Do it. James says if we hear the word and don't do it, we're deceiving ourselves. And they say, psychologists and counselors alike, that self-deception is the worst deception. And so we can be deceived into thinking that we're somebody that the Bible says we're not. 
And I challenge you here this morning that when you come across those thoughts, that you cast down those thoughts and you begin to speak over your life, because sometimes you got to speak until you believe it. How many have found that out? And you need to speak over your life. And I'm still doing this, folks. I'm still learning in areas. There's still areas where I'll be like, oh, I'm just such an idiot. And God's like, huh? Really? Oh, I messed up. I'm such an idiot. No, you're not. It's identity. It's, it's all identity. Again, they say that the worst kind of deception is self-deception. That's when you have convinced yourself to believe an untruth. And the only way out of self-deception is to be completely and radically honest with you-know-who. You. <laughs> right? Maybe it might take an intervention from a friend who actually does love you. And say, that's not who you are. That's not who you are. I've corrected people because I love them, not because I want to be right. Remember when mom come up, it was the first time she visited us, and she won't mind me saying this. But there's a saying in the Maritimes, I've heard it up here a little bit, but it's quite popular there. And we're eating dessert, and mom's like, oh, this dessert is to die for. And so I looked at mom, and I, and I love her. She's my mom, man, obviously. I said, mom, would you really die for that dessert? And she's like, no. Like, the Bible says that by your words, you will be acquitted and condemned. And by the way, Jesus said that. Right? The Bible says that the power of life and death is in the tongue, and those who love it will eat of its fruit. What fruit? Life fruit or death fruit? That's the only two you get to choose from. Moses said to Israel and the congregation of Israel that was there today, I set before you life and death. There was nothing in between. Are you following me? So what are you speaking over your identity? Is it life or is it death? Because your identity in Christ is life. Jesus said the words that I speak are spirit and life, and you've been born again by the incorruptible word. Finish with this here. I don't know if this guy's a Christian or not, but this, this, uh, this saying here is a great saying. Les Brown, he's a motivational speaker and author. He said this once, the graveyard is the richest place on earth because it is here that you will find all the hopes and dreams that were ever, never fulfilled. The books that were never written, the songs that were never sung, the inventions that were never shared, the cures that were never discovered, all because someone was too afraid to take the first step, keep with the problem, or determined enough to carry out their dream. That's crazy, eh? The graveyard is the richest place on earth. And I want to, you know, what a, what a powerful statement. And I'm willing to bet that this fear that kept the people from doing what the, the things that they could have done was rooted in their perceived identity. I guarantee. I guarantee that it was rooted in who they thought they were and who they thought who they were could and couldn't do. Amen? Perceived identity. It's powerful. It'll cause you to take things to the grave. And I want to ask you guys here this morning, who do you think you are? And what are you going to take to the grave with you when your day comes? Will it be your God-given dreams and potential? Or are, you going to, or are you going to spend them here in this life now? Or are you going to let a false identity allow you to take them to the grave unused, leaving a world behind that never got to experience what God wanted to do through you? Who you think you are matters. And who you think you are could change someone else's life. Or not. It depends on who you think you are. Some of you might know Pastor Paul Jess. He's, one of, he's the pastor of our Victory Church in, in Grand Prairie. And he said something at our last men's conference that I never forgot. When he first said it, I thought, oh, that's not a word of faith statement. He stood up there and he said, I want to die empty. You ever heard Paul say that, Pastor Paul? He's like, I want to die empty. I'm like, what is he? No, a word of faith is like, you know, you know, that doesn't sound like a word of faith statement. And what he meant was he said, I want to give out everything God has given to me, to others so that when I die, I take nothing with me to the grave. But I tell you, it's because he understands his identity in Christ that he can say something like that. Let's stand here this morning. Thank you for visiting today. If you would like to find out more about our church, visit us online at www.newvictory.ca.